Welcome everybody to our 2021 Ulysses S. and Marguerite S. Schwartz Lecture. The, Swar the Schwartz Lecture was established in 1974 to bring to our law school distinguished lawyers with experience in the academy, in practice, and in public service to share their experiences and their ideas with our law school and university community. Now, Judge Ulysses Schwartz was a longtime supporter of the university and the law school. He began his legal career as a special assistant prosecutor in the city of Chicago in 1910, and he eventually served on the Illinois Supreme Court until 1973. And following his death in 1974, a number of his friends and family members came together and established this lecture series in his honor. And in fact, Judge Schwartz's son, John, became a graduate of this law school, and he too became a judge. And he served as a federal bankruptcy judge right here in the Northern District of Illinois, including serving for almost a decade as chief of the bankruptcy court. And so the Schwartz Lecture has brought to us many distinguished speakers, and it's an honor to include in that group today's Schwartz Lecturer, Michael Gerhardt. Professor Gerhardt is the Burton Cravey Distinguished Professor of Jurisprudence at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Law. He is a leading scholar of constitutional law. He is author of over 100 law review articles, numerous treaties, and seven books, including most recently Lincoln's Mentors. He is a frequent author of op-eds in leading news publications, and he is frequently called upon by news organizations to share his expertise on constitutional law, so you may recognize him from television. His scholarly work has addressed impeachments, appointments, presidential power, precedent, the separation of powers, and he has particular expertise on the conflicts between the president and Congress. But his most important accomplishment is, the, is that he is a graduate of our law school. <laughs> and after graduating, he clerked for Robert McRae, then Chief Judge of the U.S. District Court in the Western District of Tennessee, and then for Judge Gilbert Merritt of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. And before joining the faculty of Carolina Law, Professor Gerhardt taught at William & Mary Law School. He served as the Deputy Media Director in Al Gore's first Senate campaign, and he practiced law in Washington, D.C. and Atlanta. He has served as special counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee for the confirmation processes of eight of the current nine Supreme Court justices. He served as the first legal scholar and principal advisor to the Library of Congress in revising the official United States Constitution annotated. And he has testified before Congress more than 20 times including most recently as one of only four constitutional scholars to testify before the House Judiciary Committee during President Trump's first impeachment proceeding. So we are delighted to welcome Professor Gerhardt back to the law school for this lecture. Today he will examine the significance of presidential congressional conflicts. He'll share his experiences with us, and then he will entertain questions. Please join me in welcoming back to the law school, Professor Gary. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dean. I, I greatly appreciate that. This is a historic occasion for me for a few different reasons, one of which is I got to take my mask off. Um, also, I, I have to confess it's historic because this is the first time I've worn a coat and tie into this building. Um, and I will also tell, tell you it's historic for another reason. Um, when I was last standing up here performing in any way, I made an absolute fool of myself in the end of the year law review uh, given by our class uh, nearly 40 years ago. And my objective today is not to repeat that performance. Uh, I'm going to do a little, little better, I hope. Um, it's just, a, uh, I can't even express how delighted I am to be here, how, how much honored I am to be here. So I want to make the most out of our time together. I thought I would talk about this so-called realm of the Constitution outside the court, and particularly a handful of examples of some of the interesting and challenging issues in that sphere. And then, as would be the case at the University of Chicago Law School, you will all set me straight um, 
in your comments and questions. Uh, I should begin then by saying that when we talk about congressional presidential conflicts, we know that a few of them sometimes are resolved in the courts, uh, perhaps most famously in the steel seizure case. Um, we also know uh, United States versus Nixon, another case, not so much a conflict at that time between Congress and the president, but obviously there were impending impeachment proceedings in the House at that time. One of the things we have to recognize when we think about the kinds of issues and kinds of conflicts that arise in this so-called realm is that courts are rarely available to settle differences, and courts are rarely there to even review in any serious matter whatever is happening. And that in itself presents an interesting challenge, especially for somebody who's trained as a lawyer. Uh, for one thing, um, there are all these safeguards that apply in judicial proceedings, and they apply for good reasons. Uh, there are safeguards, for example, that apply to what lawyers may be able to argue or not, how frivolous or not they may be. For example, you all know by now, you should know by now, Rule 11, among other things. Um, that's available uh, in, in court. Lawyers often avail themselves of that. No such thing in the United States Senate or Congress. Uh, rules of evidence. Rules of civil procedure, rules of criminal procedure, they all apply for various reasons, not just create certain kinds of efficiencies, but also functioning as safeguards for a variety of different reasons. No such thing in Congress. And in fact, another thing that is uh, ref uh, re reflective of being a lawyer, so to speak, in that realm of the Constitution outside the court is that there is almost no boundary uh, practically speaking, on whatever you can say or do. Politics obviously shapes a great deal of what happens. And to give you an idea of what it is going to be, what's, what it's going to feel like, what we have to kind of consider today as a challenge, is that even people in Congress don't think much of the quality of what goes on. One of this law school's greatest graduates, I may dare say, Abner Mikva, was a member of Congress for many years. And back in the 1980s, he wrote an article in the, United, in the University of North Carolina Law Review in which he argued that members of Congress are not competent to interpret the Constitution. And that was back in the 1980s. Think about what you think about that now. You know, do you think they got any more competent? Uh, are they any better? Is what you see on TV uh, representative of good discourse or not? So a challenge, though, for those of us who are in this process a lot is not just how to make sense of it, but how to navigate it. How do we function as lawyers and not just as politicians? And I will say also at the outset that I've done this now for almost 30 years, and I won't let you do the math, um, but in doing this in all that time, I've never once had a member of Congress, not once, talk to me about political issues. It has always been about the legal sides of things. So I quickly, therefore, recognize that when I talk to different senators and talk to different uh, members of the House, it's a conversation about the law, uh, and oftentimes a serious and well-informed conversa conversation about the law. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, I respect uh, Judge McVeigh a great deal. I actually was his uh, co-author on his legislative process casebook um, right up until shortly before he died. Um, and I sometimes think members of Congress are perfectly competent to interpret the Constitution for a variety of reasons. The problem is they sometimes don't want to be. The incentives there are different than they are in a courtroom. And we have to be aware of how those play out. So let's look at a few concrete examples to see how this discourse outside of the courts is a much more challenging discourse um, uh, for lawyers, for people who care about the Constitution, uh, and for people who care about ethics. Uh, so one of the things that happens is um, in any impeachment proceeding, as you all well know, is there's a perennial question. It's interesting that it is a perennial question. And the question is, what's an impeachable offense? Now, after decades, and I dare say centuries, it's rather interesting and I would say disappointing that people have to still debate that. It's not settled in the way it might be in a courtroom. 
Scholars, by the way, I think are almost completely in agreement that as far as impeachable offenses go, not all impeachable offenses are felonies or need to be felonies, and not all felonies are impeachable offenses. That, if you want to think of it, is some of the so-called black letter law. But if you were to visit, let's say, after the Nixon proceedings and look at Clinton and look at the two Trump impeachment proceedings, you might find it difficult to hear anybody talk about that, particularly on the um, side of the members of Congress or the Senate, who actually agree with that statement of the law. And one of the major reasons why is because they have no real incentive to agree with it. In that environment, think of a political, presidential impeachment trial or impeachment proceeding. It is about as volatile political proceeding as you can imagine. And in that proceeding, some things are quite predictable and therefore we need to prepare for them. One of them is if you have a president of the United States, oh, let's say Andrew Johnson, and he is cursing Congress out, uh, which he did regularly, um, and he wants to frustrate Reconstruction, which he did regularly. Um, Congress, therefore, might seek to impeach him, as it did when he fired his Secretary of St uh, War, Edwin Stanton, in violation of the then applicable Tenure in Office Act. Um, Johnson, by the way, had some terrific lawyers, one of whom was Benjamin Curtis, one, uh, a dissenter in Dred Scott, and certainly one of the great 19th century Supreme Court advocates and just lawyers generally. And Curtis's argument before the House, and particularly before the Senate, was that an impeachable offense has to be a crime. Now, why would he make that argument? Because it served his purposes. Uh, Johnson wasn't uh, uh, charged with actually having committed a felony or an actual crime. Um, he was a charge of a variety of other things. But one defense that appears that is useful in, uh, for the president and later, uh, and Johnson and later, is to argue, OK, let's narrow the field of what's an impeachable offense. Um, and let's narrow it to the point it's got to be an actual crime, an indictable crime. And since Johnson hadn't committed any indictable crime, we should acquit him. Look, it's a very simple argument. Even I can state it. It's right out there, very clear. It may not track the law very neatly or maybe accurately at all. Uh, but it serves its ultimate purpose, which is to get the person acquitted. And if possible, deflect the House from impeaching the person. Now we fast forward to the Bill Clinton proceedings. Bill Clinton's charged with actually violating a, a statute, obstruction of justice, another statute, perjury. These are two felonies. And the House impeaches Clinton for both those. So Clinton can't argue in that case, oh my gosh, it can never be a felony. Well, that's not a good argument, not a sound argument, not even an effective one in that circumstance. What is Clinton's argument? Not all felonies are impeachable. And guess what? I happen to have been charged with two felonies that are not impeachable. You know, I lied about something completely unimportant. Uh, it took him a while to concede that he lied about it, by the way. Um, there's the lawyer in him. Um, and then as far as the Senate was concerned, you know, of course, he gets acquitted. Now we go to Trump, the two Trump impeachments. First uh, impeachment, of course, has to do with uh, Trump's uh, asking for a favor from the president of Ukraine um, and otherwise uh, perhaps uh, abusing his powers of the presidency in his negotiations with Ukraine and his actions relating to Ukraine. Um, needless to say, I think one of the things Trump is up to in that circumstance is Trump wanted to uh, do what he could to help himself in the upcoming presidential election, and to do that by getting Ukraine to just announce that they were opening a criminal investigation into Joe Biden, not because there was any merit to it, but because that would hurt Biden politically. He gets impeached for that, but his defense uh, was, if you kind of cut through all the chaos and the, and the sort of uh, hyperbolic rhetoric, um, and the, and the table pounding, which was quite prevalent uh, during that proceeding, uh, the defense basically was, look, um, you've, got, you've got a couple of problems. One is um, you're charging him with something that's not an actual crime. We've heard that kind of defense before. So therefore, uh, it's got to be 
not impeachable. Um, and the other thing Trump is arguing, of course, is that the other side is more criminal than me. Um, uh, and as I said as a witness, the very fact that somebody else is doing something wrong doesn't make Trump innocent. That floated about as well there as it did here, just like a, <laughs> you know, just like a lead balloon goes in there. People go, what did he say? You know, um, not sure what the relevance of that was. You know? um, and this is because the hearing was infused with politics. Now, there's a second thing that's related to this first phenomenon I've been talking about. The first phenomenon, again, being how the political uh, stakes are going to actually shape, influence, drive the process. You cannot expect an erudite constitutional discourse in a presidential impeachment proceeding. Um, we have lots of counterexamples to that. Um, the closest we came, interestingly enough, was with Nixon. Uh, with Richard Nixon, you had the House Judiciary Committee issued a report on the history of the uh, uh, impeachment clauses and scope of impeachable offenses. It is a fabulous document. Still reliable today, still credible. This is a great work. And the fact that um, uh, there were historians involved in helping to write it only made it better. Um, and we know there was some bipartisan support, not just for impeaching Nixon in the House, but there would have been for convicting him in the Senate. So Nixon is, to some extent, sort of an example how we sometimes say the system worked. Um, now, Donald Trump said Nixon was, was a coward, wasn't manly enough. And so therefore, um, there was no, Trump was never going to resign, as Nixon did. And uh, we knew that going in. So if he's not going to resign, that means we have to use the process. And if we use the process, we know something about that process, which also makes impeachment itself remarkably ineffective. And that is you need at least two thirds of the Senate to convict and remove somebody from office. And trying to get at least two thirds of the Senate to agree on anything is really hard. They can't even agree on Arbor Day or you know, should, we, should we congratulate the Tampa Buc Buccaneers or not? You know, what should we do? You know? um, and, and so with that requirement, with that threshold for uh, conviction and removal, we have a perfect record of no president having been convicted and removed from office. Andrew Johnson, about as unpopular a president as you ever could get, not removed. Bill Clinton probably did lie under oath. In fact, a, a federal judge later said he lied under oath and sanctioned him for that. Bill Clinton, his popularity rose every day of the impeachment proceeding. By the time he got to the Senate, I was telling people he could break 100. You know, uh, <laughs> if, it, if it keeps going, I think he's there. Um, so Clinton's not convicted and removed. Donald Trump doesn't have to be popular. Here's the other thing we have to understand. He's got hardcore partisan support. His political party is unified. And one of the things we then learn about impeachment is an impeachment of a president, is that as long as the president keeps his political party unified in Congress, he's virtually immune to conviction and removal from office. All Democrats uh, voted to acquit Bill Clinton in his Senate impeachment trial. Five Republicans broke ranks, but it wouldn't have mattered. I'm not good at math, but the 45 Democrats was enough to prevent a two-thirds removal at all. Um, and then, of course, if you fast forward to Trump, on both occasions, you have more than enough Republican senators, as long as they remain unified, that there's no chance you're going to convict and remove him. In which case, we have to think our, to ourselves, what else is there? What, is, what else is there for trying to hold somebody accountable, particularly the President of the United States, hold a President accountable for misconduct in office? Back when I was sitting there, and somewhere in a classroom here, um, I had thought that impeachment might be an effective mechanism for presidential misconduct, partly because I was a child of Watergate, but also because I, I figured people in Congress might care about the rule of law. And I have to tell you, I'm not sure I was right then, and I have great skepticism now. 
because the rise of political partisanship has been so great, it has overwhelmed many things in our political system, including impeachment. It might not matter very much with the judicial impeachment, but it matters a great deal. In fact, it may be the only thing that really matters in a presidential impeachment trial because the framers invested the impeachment authority in politically accountable officials, and therefore those politically accountable officials, who by the way have become more politically accountable over time because senators are now directly elected in the states, um, those members of Congress are gonna be acutely sensitive to how things are playing in the public, what public opinion is. The framers themselves, I think, would not have cared about public opinion. I think they set up the impeachment process as a check not just against presidential misconduct, but as you all well know, um, the framers distrusted the public. They set up a constitution that was designed to frustrate majoritarian will and certainly public opinion. And it's done that over the years. But as the, as the constitution has changed and our culture has changed and our values have changed, now we have a system that is perhaps not just acutely sensitive to public opinion, but maybe even arguably overly sensitive to public opinion so that turning to impeachment as a sanction against pre serious presidential misconduct is quixotic at best. Now a couple of other things about that process I want to share with you just a little bit informed by I guess somewhat um, of an inside point of view and here I have to use a, uh, issue a disclaimer. It's always important to issue disclaimers. Um, I, I had the honor of being able to work as special counsel to Patrick Leahy, who was the presiding officer in the second impeachment trial. So therefore, everything I'm about to say today is just from me, it's my personal perspective, not in any way attributable to anybody else. And I'm not, of course, sharing anything uh, that would be inappropriate. Um, having said that, as we look at the second uh, proceeding against Trump, we can see how the process, again, um, is complicated not just by the politics of it, but in this situation, by the timing. To begin with, um, I happened to be in Washington on January 5th. This is the least important part of the thing. Um, and I was there meeting with some senators, talking about some other issues. And I drove home that night. Um, one of my fondest moments is being able to see Washington in my rearview mirror. I, it's, you know, I go, in, I go in there in a situation in which things are relatively intense. Uh, Chris Coons, Democratic senator from Delaware, I have enormous affection and regard for him. One said as he came into a meeting, oh, Mike Gerhardt's here. We've got a constitutional crisis. Yeah, um, and so, and so, yeah, so yeah, people tend to run when they see me. Um, um, and so, uh, and that's true. If there's a constitutional crisis, I might, I might well be there. And I'm, by the way, I'm not the cause. Um, <laughs> I'm to some extent the effect of it, but I'm not the cause. Um, and so I went back January 5th relatively happy, not thinking I would be back anytime soon. January 6th happens, and I'm back January 7th. Um, and I'm there for a while, um, as it turns out. Uh, the first thing that has to happen is uh, the House has to consider whether or not to impeach the President of the United States. And here we have a situation in which time is running out. We know, those of us who care about facts, um, and let me just really emphasize at this point here, that we are all part of a fact-driven profession. We care about facts. Facts are important to lawyers. We care about the processes set up to vet and verify and challenge facts. Uh, we don't typically and shouldn't operate on the seat of our pants and make stuff up, engage in fiction. And as I'm about to tell you at the end of all this, the lots of lawyers did. Lots of lawyers were completely and thoroughly irresponsible in both Trump impeachments, but I'll get, I'll get there in a minute. Um, that's known as a teaser. Um, <laughs> and so, um, uh, one of the things, uh, therefore, uh, the House had to figure out very quickly was do we impeach it was a similar thing that they had to figure out back in 2019. Do we impeach Trump? And I think the reasoning on the House side was the same in both situations, but even more intensely so in the second situation. And that is, in the first situation, 
The House impeached Trump. People say, why would the House impeach Trump knowing he's going to be acquitted in the Senate? Part of the answer might be it's partisan. But we have to be, recognize the decision making within institutions like that is more complex. It isn't just partisan. There's something else going on. And the something else going on in that first impeachment scenario was that the House could not choose not to impeach Trump. Think about the precedent that that sets. That a president could do what he did, and we can debate the facts if you want. Uh, the president could do what he did, and if the House does nothing, that's, that's known as a free pass. And I don't think the House could bring itself, certainly the leadership could not bring itself to give Trump a free pass the first time. They certainly could not bring themselves to give, give him a free pass the second time. After all, the second time, the House itself had been attacked. Now, I believe in facts. I put that on the record. Um, <laughs> and I can tell you there was not just a rather rowdy, rowdy tour going on January 6th. There was a deadly attack against Congress. And I saw the wreckage every day I was there. I saw not just the broken and damaged windows. I saw the, the fences that had to be put up for the National Guard. Um, I was greeted every morning. I went into the Senate at that time by, by the National Guard. Um, and I had to get through them in order to get to the Senate. Um, I, yes, I did feel a little safer going into the Senate, but I felt it's a little bit sad that you know, this is a seat of our government and we can't even trust the people who might want to get into that building. Um, that's part of the legacy, too. Um, I saw the broken door and window into the Senate chamber when I would sit behind Senator Leahy as he was the presiding officer. I was just feet away from that. Um, I sat in the United States Senate right behind Senator Leahy watching the video shown to all the senators that showed how the senators were reacting to the attack on the Senate. You may recall one scene in which Chuck Schumer's running down one hall, led by Eugene Goodman, true American patriot, by the way. Um, and then just seconds later, Goodman's bringing him back. And then we you count the seconds. One, two, three, and about five, you see a crowd running with sticks and knives and weapons. And they're searching not to shake Chuck Schumer's hand. They're, they're, they're searching to do him harm. There's no other way to explain that. In a circumstance like that, you, the House, as we saw, will and likely should stand up for its own institutional prerogatives. And that's what happened with the next impeachment of Trump. Uh, the timing was relevant, I think, for the House under those circumstances only in the sense that it had to move fast, but it was also relevant because it helped define the context. And oftentimes in law, context is everything. And so with the second impeachment uh, of Trump, uh, the very fact that the president had been repeatedly uh, attacking the electoral system, particularly its integrity, and planning, in a sense, to undermine the legitimacy of the election, that's a very dangerous circumstance to get into. And so um, I don't think there was much doubt at all that in the second impeachment proceeding there would be, would be impeachment. And it was drafted by and large by Jamie Raskin, whom, as you may all know, is a former constitutional law professor, uh, for a friend of mine, a really nice guy, really smart guy, and unfortunately, a grieving parent at that time. A horrible, horrible loss of his son in that circumstance. But Jamie felt it was his duty it wasn't just a partisan thing. Jamie felt it was his duty to stand up for the institution of the, uh, of the House and also for the rule of law. After all, we law professors, although we rate really low on popularity polls, um, right below cockroaches, we're way, way at the bottom, except for Jeff and the dean and, and Kurt. Yeah, they're, and Rick, Rick, they're all at the top. You know. The rest of us, we're not. Um, but in that scenario, um, the, the challenge, obviously, is um, whether or not people will, uh, not just in Congress, but elsewhere, be able to understand the process and look at impeachment 
as one of the most important sanctions we have available for holding a president accountable for serious misconduct. And here, too, the partisan hold, partisan fidelity, prevented any serious chance for a conviction. However, seven Republicans breaking ranks to vote to convict is historic. It's the largest vote in American history to convict and remove a president from office. I don't know about you, um, but presidents, by and large, don't like to see that on their tombstones. Um, and it still rankles Bill Clinton to this day to know that when his day comes, the first paragraph of his obituary in the New York Times will likely say, impeached president. By the time you become a president, which is quite an ascent, one of the things you do care about, I think you have to care about, is your legacy. And even though Donald Trump puts up a, a, a strong face, so to speak, and a brave front and all the rest, he cares a great deal about his legacy. And the fact that he's been impeached twice is something um, he has to run away from. Now, it does make him a martyr in certain circumstances, uh, but it doesn't make him, uh, in a sense, a great president. It makes him an example, by and large, of what not to do in office, except for a couple things. So I just want to get to these two things, and then I'm going to open up to all of you. One of the things I, I want to get to is um, another lesson I think we can draw from the impeachment process. And here I'm going a little bit out on a limb, but that's my job as a law professor and as a scapegoat. You know, I'm doing all that here. Um, one of the things that struck me as I was going through the two Trump impeachments, and I don't think this was a secret to anybody in the White House or, for that matter, anybody in Congress, um, that Trump himself had become um, a defender of a robust, conception of the unitary theory of the executive. Now, the unitary theory of the executive, I hope all of you know, uh, is a view first expressed in a single dissent in Morrison versus Olson by Justice Scalia. And that theory holds that the President of the United States should be in the control of all executive power. All executive power is consolidated in the person of the president, period. A robust conception of it would lead a president to do exactly what Trump was doing, not just in the first impeachment, but in the second. For example, arguing he had an absolute executive privilege. Near the end of the first impeachment, Trump said, I'm in control of all the information, and I'm not going to share it with you. That's, a president could do that. A president can do that, especially outside of the courts, but a president can do that in the context of a, a presidential impeachment. But if the president has all the information, he get, can control the outcome. The only way to address that, to deal with it, actually arises from something else I remember from my study of Watergate, my experience of Watergate. I was in high school. Um, you all know the United States versus Nixon case, the unanimous decision upholding that presidents must comply with judicial subpoenas, particularly in a criminal trial. Um, that's the context of U.S. versus Nixon. It's qualified executive privilege. But that's a, that's a court case. Not necessarily controlling, and we don't see it controlling, the interaction between presidents and Congress. In that different context, presidents and Congress, presidents have an institutional interest in asserting they have an absolute executive privilege. Now, after U.S. versus Nixon came down, two very prominent law professors, people who uh, commanded enormous respect, one was Gerald Gunther at Stanford. The other was Charles Black at Yale. They co-wrote an op-ed saying U.S. versus Nixon was wrong. Now, trust me, um, when scholars of that eminence take that position, you would be wise to think about it. Um, and their argument, in part, was presidents need an absolute executive privilege to be able to stay on an equal footing with the other branches. And they went further to say, and the sanction that has to be employed uh, if presidents abuse this, 
refused to give information about, for example, being in criminal concert uh, or being part of a conspiracy, the sanction was impeachment. And incidentally, that's part of the basis for the article of impeachment against Trump the second time, obstruction of Congress. That was also modeled on the third, and some people say weakest article of impeachment that had been directed against Richard Nixon. The third article against Nixon said he had failed to comply with four legislative subpoenas, and therefore he was, in, in a sense, contempt of Congress, he was obstructing Congress, we should make that a basis for impeachment. Trump had failed to comply with at least 10 subpoenas, among many other laws he wasn't failing to comply with. So there was a basis uh, for the article in Trump's case in the second impeachment for an article saying he was liable or guilty, or whatever word you want to use, for obstruction of Congress. Now, Gunther and Black knew a lot of what they were talking about, and I had the privilege of being able to talk to Jerry Gunther about this more than once as I was doing some of my early work on impeachment. Um, and I remember asking, um, well, what if it turns out that because the president is not sharing information, people in his party will not see this as a legitimate obstruction of Congress? There's a little bit of pause on the other end of the phone. <laughs> he said, well, that, then it, you know, he said, well, I guess you know, one of the things we've got to remember and I, 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 is they're politically accountable. And I said, yes, they are politically accountable, but what if their voters like what they're doing? That's Trump's second impeachment. Um, if you ever want to know uh, what, uh, where the law is, in a sense, unclear, weak, ambiguous, it's exactly where the attacks go. It's exactly where people will direct their, um, their arguments. Uh, and we saw this in the, in the uh, second in Trump impeachment. Okay, what about the safeguards? I know I've got brought everybody down at this point. You know, um, uh, There are some safeguards, um, but they are not foolproof. One of them has to be, of course, elections. And one of the things that made the two Trump impeachments really difficult is that his conduct in both cases was aimed at undermining electoral integrity. Elections can be gained. They can be gained. Uh, elections can be undermined, and they are undermined. People can lie. People can do a lot of different things, and it may never make the light of day even in an election, or it may not even make a difference in an election. But if the president's misconduct relates to the very elections that are designed in part to hold him accountable, there is a tremendous dilemma. Uh, and that's one of the challenges we have all lived through over the last few years. A related challenge to all of that is that uh, two other safeguards might uh, are important and may help to sort of fortify the electoral part of it as, as, a, as another safeguard. One of them is education. Uh, the framers, by and large, believe education was a good. The framers believe, for example, James Madison, that education, they just trusted the public, but they figured education could be their salvation. The more informed people got, the more they could participate responsibly in public life. Um, and another challenge, of course, we live in an era in which there is disdain for education, uh, disdain for facts. Uh, the world is flat. Why? Because I say so. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to believe that there's a virus out, out there, so I won't act as if there were. Um, you know, I don't want to believe that I could, uh, uh, and by the way, I've been vaccinated boosted and everything else. So I don't, but I don't want to infect anybody with this virus at all. Um, and it's just because I have a positive mindset. You know, I don't know about you, but that's not how science works. Uh, but education means, among other things, caring about knowledge and caring about the tests that we employ to verify things, to check things, to make sure uh, that they themselves, if we want to think about this, that the facts themselves are accountable, that we make them subject to scrutiny and rigorous methodology. Um, and I think education uh, has to be one of the things that we would look to as a way to get better informed, not just about the presidency, 
but about the threats to democracy. Uh, and what's important in that endeavor is, uh, is a knowledge about an interest in history. Understanding the facts of our past, not making them up. I grew up in Alabama. I now live in North Carolina, where there are alternative facts all the time about what happened in the Civil War, about whether there was a Civil War. I happen to be Jewish. There are people who doubt whether or not there was a Holocaust. These things, by the way, um, I defer to Professor Stone on this, but I'm not so sure there's a, you can say you don't believe in the Holocaust. That's fine. You have a right to say that. But even when you say that, to maintain that that is not an equal par with the fact that there was a Holocaust, um, that's a more dangerous thing. Uh, and I think we saw a lot of that with the, the Trump impeachments. Alternative facts, as Kelly Conway once said. Um, I, and this brings me to my last safeguard, one of the last important things I think for us to think about. Lawyers should care about ethics. Uh, and one of, the th uh, one of the things that I witnessed, um, certainly over the last few years, was a remarkable disregard for legal ethics, and particularly on the part of government lawyers. Um, when I teach legal ethics, it's a very important class. You may not think it is. It may be the most important class you take, because it's the class, I think, that really tests whether or not you are going to be committed to the very things that distinguish our profession. And among those things uh, are various commitments that were absent in both Trump impeachments. And I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, one of them is, involves a graduate of this law school. And I'm not here to give Pat Cipollone a hard time. But actually, I am here to give Pat Cipollone a hard time. Much like Pat, I can argue both ways at the same time. Yeah. Um, and so um, I remember uh, Pat Cipollone, for those of you who don't recall, was the chief White House counsel to President Trump, during, uh, particularly during the first impeachment. And he was also there during the second, but I'm talking now about the first impeachment. And when Pat came before the Senate um, impeachment trial, the Senate, he got up, and one of the things he said, and my ears perked up when he said this, is, um, well, you know, this situation we're looking at would make for a wonderful law exam. I was thinking, oh, really? OK. Um, and then he proceeded to say, OK, here's the question. Assume we have an, a partisan impeachment, or unconstitutional impeachment. And then he proceeded to relate his facts. I had a couple thoughts in reaction to that. And one is, he was assuming the most important part of the inquiry. Um, could you have an unconstitutional impeachment? That's a very interesting question. But just to assume it away, um, I think it would not be a good part of legal reasoning. Wouldn't, wouldn't make the test very interesting as well. Um, uh, and, and I think more importantly, what Pat was doing was he was revealing something about his own thinking. If you read the White House brief and listen to the White House lawyers, they were assuming it was an unconstitutional impeachment because there were no facts to support them. There's nothing in the United States Constitution that prevents a partisan impeachment. Nothing. There could be a political argument against it. But you go read the Constitution. It doesn't say you have to have so many people from each party voting in the majority in the House and so many people from each party voting to convict in the Senate. It doesn't say that. Not in my copy, anyway. Um, and so that, that's a political argument. And this is what we come to expect in a circumstance like that. The political arguments uh, masquerading is a kind of constitutional or legal argument. And that's going to degrade our understanding of the Constitution, degrade the Constitution itself, and I think ultimately degrade the lawyers themselves. Um, Pat then proceeded both in that argument and in, had done this in the brief submitted to the Senate. He engaged in a lot of different things, which I think and have already written to this effect, violated the rules of professional responsibility all over the place. I'll just give you a couple examples. Rule 3.3 requires candor before a tribunal. Um, 
And what that means is, if you look at the comments, the comments say tribunals may include legislatures. That means that you need to be prepared to identify uh, conflicting authority. Uh, you need to be able to identify uh, facts that may not be able and fully supportive of your, your position. And you may not, other rules do this, for example, 8.4, prevent you from engaging in false and misleading statements. Pat's brief and Pat's argument and those of all the other lawyers that just helped him found this new office in Washington, D.C., all their arguments were either false or misleading. They were predicated on a, a number of false assumptions. Um, but saying, uh, and, and I'll end at this point by saying, for example, even in the second impeachment, which is not Pat's argument, because it's a lot of lawyers involved in this kind of uh, problematic behavior, in the second impeachment, um, the lawyer said, and I'm almost quoting, uh, that President Trump on January 6th was, was telling people about engaging in a peaceful, orderly, lawful protest. I don't know if you've seen that tape. By the way, there would be no such tape in which that was the message. Um, it is true, as the lawyer said, that Trump mentioned that there should be a peaceful protest. That's true. He mentioned it once. And more than 20 times mentioned there should be a fight and there should be combat. And if you took the duty of candor seriously as a lawyer, you would not stand up in a courtroom and say that thing. And if you did stand up in a courtroom and said that in, con in contradiction to the record, ignoring huge parts of the record, any judge, any disciplinary authority would be well within its rights to hold you accountable. Our difficulty is with the Constitution outside the court that lawyers feel even freer not to comply with the very things that define their profession and ensure their integrity. So I'm coming full around, all the way around now to say, it's all going to be up to you. Your integrity is what's going to make a difference in terms of whether or not presidents actually do, do the wrong things or not. Somebody, not just on the outside, but people on the inside, have to be there protecting as well, ensuring that the rule of law is respected. Um, and if it's not, then lawyers are complicit with what, whatever the illegality is or with whatever the unconstitutional action may be. This may be a good place to stop, and hopefully there's a few minutes left. That was historic, too. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> um, well, again, it's, it's a very effective, I mean, the way we would, I, I would analyze it is, first of all, we have to say that's an effective political point. It doesn't have much to do with reality, but it's an effective political point to say the House hasn't really done its fact-finding. Now, if we press that a little bit, is the, fact, is the House required to do, do any of its own fact-finding? The answer is no. Uh, anybody think of an example where the House didn't do any fact-finding before it impeached a president of the United States? Before that, Bill Clinton. House did zero fact-finding. They actually took a referral from the independent counsel and just relied on everything in there as a fact. And then they impeached the president, and then it all went to the Senate. Um, now, the other thing about the, 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 the McConnell statement is there was actually a kind of a double whammy involved there. That's a legal term, double whammy. Um, and so um, on the one hand, he's saying, well, the House didn't do its job, should have done fact-finding. And the House members are saying, we're going to impeach, and there'll be a trial in the Senate. But then when it gets to the Senate, McConnell says, well, you didn't do any fact-finding over there, so we're not going to pay any attention to it over here. Um, and that's all effective political leadership. Um, one of the things that was most disturbing to me, now standing back from this process and just thinking about it more as a so, uh, legal scholar, is I became enormously concerned about the institutional fidelity that members of Congress had. Um, it's, if, if they're faithful to their parties, I get that. But to what extent do they care about the institutional prerogatives? Uh, and the more the Senate waved them away, the more the Senate abdicated them, I think the weaker the Senate got and the stronger the 
presidency got. So the House uh, historically drafts the articles of impeachment. In a sense, those set the terms. The House, by the way, historically has, it's, sometimes it's done its own investigations, sometimes it didn't. For example, I mentioned the Andrew Johnson, sorry, the Andrew Johnson impeachment by the House, no investigation. He had written a letter saying, I fired Stanton, and that was all they had to have. And um, there was no investigation. Um, and like I said, there's none with Clinton. Um, so this is one of those things we've got to watch, I think, particularly when um, uh, politics is such a driving force. Uh, so when McConnell said what you've said he said, the other thing to think about is, um, well, um, somebody's got to hold him accountable for the mistruth. Uh, that's false. We all know another um, false, misleading statement. It was made to block Merrick Garland. Uh, McConnell said at that time, we're not going to act on Merrick Garland because we, the Senate, don't really act on uh, Supreme Court nominations during an election year. I, I don't know if you've looked at this history, but that's just completely and utterly false. Um, uh, even John Marshall was appointed when Adams was a lame duck, you'd think that's even worse. Um, and Jefferson, who was, certainly didn't like Marshall, said nothing. Didn't, didn't question that at all. Um, so part of what we've got to do, and this is part of my job, obviously, when I'm there, is I, I'm listening to all this, um, taking a lot of, you know, a lot, takes a lot of fortitude. Uh, <laughs> I'm listening to all this. Um, and then I'm trying, thinking, okay, you know, how we've got to, which ones do we respond to? How do we respond? That's, part, that's my job, in part. And so, um, and I'm thinking that sometimes we don't want to um, dignify some of these arguments. Um, and sometimes we may want to correct the record, so to speak. And so that, McConnell's comment was one of those things where I think we, we felt like, okay, we can correct the record. You know, history is very different than that. Uh, and then we can move on to deal with what we thought were more important things. It depends on who's president, but you'd be right. Yeah. And by the way, most of you are too old now to be nominated to the D.C. Circuit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and so, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to burst any bubbles. Uh, um, uh, you're absolutely right. And this, by the way, is also one of the problems, if you want to think of it that way, when Trump, look, there's, on the one side, when Trump sort of issued his list of judges, you could say, oh, that's transparent, that's good. But on the other hand, if you're on that list, for a year or two, you are now in the position of having to audition to move up that list. And how are you gonna do it? And you just spot it. One way you're gonna do it is you're gonna, you have to check the boxes. And you better have something in your record that suggests you have the right kind of um, understanding of executive power. A robust theory of the executive being one of them. And the question is, uh, you expressed concern about um, uh, maybe putting too much emphasis on the lawyers who, who um, made ludicrous arguments, who were somewhat irresponsible in saying maybe there, there are a lot of lawyers that do that afterwards, and what can be done about that? Is that fair rehashing? Um, it's a really good question. Um, and and I, I don't want to minimize, in fact, really just the opposite. I don't want to minimize the fact, look, in the real world, and this is where we live, uh, at least most of us, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, we care what our clients think. And if your client happens to be President of the United States, you're not going to say no to him very often. If you say no to him probably more than once, you're looking for a new job. Uh, or he's not going to listen to you very much. Um, and of course, what does the President want in a White House counsel? The President doesn't want somebody as White House counsel who's there to make his life more difficult. He wants somebody there who will actually make it um, easier, will actually help him not just fulfill his agenda, but to be able to navigate through the kinds of problems he's got to navigate through. And there are many and they're complex. Um, so it may be a naive to think that the lawyers who are in that position can do very much to check the system, can check any kind of misconduct. Um, we, have a, we have some counterexamples. Um, John Dean, for example, um, uh, was, was, the, was the entire White House Counsel's office under Richard Nixon. Um, and it gives you some idea how things have changed, that Dean was the only lawyer in the White House Counsel's office under Nixon, and now we have typically more, probably roughly 30 in the White House Counsel's office. Um, and, um, and I think that, 
And I, the only, so, so you're absolutely right to suggest it would be wrong, naive to think that somehow these lawyers could prevent something bad from happening. But what, one thing maybe lawyers can do is they can sometimes, um, they can channel the discourse. They can change the way the conversation happens. They can, uh, and I think with Trump it was a particularly difficult thing because Trump always wanted to do it his way. And the lawyers, as we all know, wanted to please Trump. They were always arguing to an audience of one. Um, and again, that, that makes sense under the circumstances. The question becomes, what if are the safeguards in a circumstance like that? Because if we just give the lawyers a pass, as we might have to, then we have to think of ourselves, what, what other checks are going to be in place uh, that might be effective? Um, and among those would be, I think, a robust congressional oversight. Um, I think uh, one of the unfortunate things is we can easily vi identify violations of the legal ethics rules all over the place, but you don't get uniform enforcement of them. Um, one of the things that happened after Watergate is they started teaching legal ethics thinking that was going to produce more ethical lawyers. I will leave you to decide whether or not, not, whether or not that experiment worked. Um, but um, one thing that is pivotal to that initial strategy of teaching legal ethics in law school is you've got to have uniform and broad enforcement of those rules, otherwise they mean nothing. And most of the time, lawyers, to the extent they know the rules, don't think they'll ever be held accountable for them. And one reason why this happens a lot with government lawyers is because if you can even get the matter before an ethics committee, and I've been on the ethics committee at North Carolina for a long time, um, but one of the challenges um, is that uh, ethics committees are, are very reluctant to go after lawyers who are in public positions because of the difficulty of trying to draw a line between law and politics. Uh, they'll say, well, you know, you're chief White House counsel, a lot of, like, your job isn't, yes, you're a lawyer and you're dealing with legalities and stuff, but there's, a, there's political concerns as well. Um, and we would, again, be naive to ignore that. Um, so it also uh, reminds me that, you know, something Cormac McCarthy said, no country for old men. He said, we do, if you're good, you don't need the law. And if you're bad, you're not going to follow it. Now, that's terrible for a law profession, right? Um, but I, this is my sign, signal. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm able to perceive that that's a signal. Yeah. Um, but you ask a terrific question. I think the answer is also cultural. And we can talk about that more. Thank you. Thank you.